morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, and welcome to our second month of life. Thanks for joining. Uh, we have quite interesting things on the agenda today, so I'll make my introduction uh, super quick. Before we, um, we continue, I'd like to quickly go through our um, events initiative where we, we, we announce some interesting events. Yeah, where we share some interesting events. Uh, the first one is DataFest Africa, which is currently ongoing. Um, you can see there the topic of the of the conference is um, data futures, big data, little data, everything in between. If you want to find out more about the event, you can um, use. I can actually send a link to this presentation and then you can also find uh, all the links in the meeting doc, which I'm about to share in a minute. The next one is the Summer Summit. It is after five days um, and the topics go around AI, data privacy, cybersecurity, product safety and other interesting stuff. The International Data Week, um, which is also in five days. And basically, it's about using data to improve science and society through data-driven innovation and discovery. The agenda for today will be yeah, introduction, which is already um, going. Then we're going to have a presentation uh, from Claire, Claire Herbert. Um, she's a She's a data manager for the Canadian Watershed Information Network, or CANWIN, and also a program manager for the Manitoba Great Lakes Program at the Center of Earth Observation Science at the University of Manitoba. After the presentation, we are going to have a Q&A session where we will open the floor for any questions. And just to mention, there are two ways to, to ask a question. Um, you can raise a hand and go ahead or you can drop things in the chat after the q a session um, we will have some community announcements and sharing where alex gostev will give us some updates on the second 3.0 product strategy as you know uh, we kicked off in april we kicked off this initiative and also if anybody wants to share something um, with the community feel free to do it this is the time now, if you want to add things to the agenda, you can do that um, in the meeting doc. I will drop a link in the chat uh, after I finish my introduction. You can also write here in the chat, for example, and I'll keep an eye and make sure everything is captured. Um, also, if you want to suggest a topic for a next meetup, you can do that in the meeting doc as well. Um, as always, I encourage everyone to open the meeting doc, drop your name, affiliation, what brings you to CCAN. We are here to connect, so um, it'll be cool to have your contact details. And just to flag to people, the meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Now, before I give the word to Claire, I'd like to introduce Talita, uh, who is the new marketing manager at Link Digital. Um, she was about to make a longer introduction of herself and um, and can win because they've been working together closely. But unfortunately, her voice is now um, low and yeah, she's not feeling very well. That's why I think, um, yeah, if, Talita, if you want to say hi, say hi. If not, um, yeah, hi, see. everybody. <laughs> As uh, Joanna has just said, I'm the um marketing manager for Link Digital and I've been working uh, closely with uh, Claire to write the informed case study you can see also on our LinkedIn page and our website as well <clears throat> excuse me well with that being said I think it's time for us to kick off the the presentation so Claire please let me know if um, you can share your screen thank you yes I believe I'm able to Still nothing. It keeps telling me it's paused for some reason. Try again. But I will start by um, introducing myself. Uh, so as uh, Joanna said, I am the data manager for the Canadian Watershed Information Network at the University of Manitoba, uh, which is housed within the faculty of the 
environment. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And I am actually a biogeographer by training, which is a fancy way of saying that I study freshwater systems using satellites as well as uh, going on to the landscape. Okay, before I begin, I'm going to also acknowledge that uh, the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Ojibwe, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, and we respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And I am located in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is in the center of Canada, uh, at the University of Manitoba. <clears throat> so, the Canadian Watershed Information Network is a Canadian spatial research data infrastructure system, which is hosted at the U of M, as we was mentioned, and it's managed by the Centre for Earth Observation Science, or CIOS, which is within the Faculty of Environment, Earth and Resources. CIOS is a leading multidisciplinary and collaborative research centre focused on understanding how the Earth will respond to climate change. CIOS researchers conduct their fieldwork all over the world. However, the Arctic freshwater marine system is a unifying focus of activity because climate change affects this region more acutely than anywhere else in the world. Our Arctic research is also one of the three signature research areas for the university, with the other two areas being in medicine. And the mandate of Canwin is to lower the latency for real-time decision-making and support evidence-based policy-making in the Hudson Bay drainage basin. And I included this map just to give those who are not familiar with our Canadian landscape an idea of the research area uh, which we cover. But as our collaborators are global, the data sets we host can also include data collected from projects that occur anywhere in the world. So in Canada, this is the province I live in, Manitoba. I live at the south end of this lake, Winnipeg, in Winnipeg. And our this um, data center was originally developed to house data from the Lake Winnipeg Basin um, and then through our Arctic research has expanded into the Nelson River watershed and into Hudson Bay. So this area covers from the west just before the Rockies in Canada to just before Lake Superior in the east and into four U.S. provinces. So it's, um, it's an international watershed and then all that water flows up into Hudson Bay and into the high Arctic. And this is just an inset map. So we are also part of the Canadian Consortium for Arctic Data Interoperability, or CCADI. The CCADI was established in 2015, and it was funded in 2019 through a Canada Foundation for Innovation Cyber Infrastructure Grant. The CCADI is a pan-Canadian collaboration between six universities and multiple Indigenous governmental and nonprofit organizations to develop an Arctic research data infrastructure. And the key goals of this initiative are to develop standards and mechanisms for metadata interoperability, semantic interoperability and implementation, which is a fancy way of staying language, and streamline data services with common entry access, search, match, analysis, visualization, and output tools. So through the CCADI, Canwin also collaborates with global partners including the Arctic Data Committee, the Arctic Observing Summit, the Open Geospatial Consortium, the Research Data Alliance, and the World Data System. To give you a bit of background about how uh, I came to where we are currently, in the early 2000s, Environment and Climate Change Canada, which is the federal agency responsible for Canada's climate change strategy, identified having a central data source for freshwater-related research as a priority. They began building a database internally using ASPX and Visual Basic. And through extensive multiple stakeholder consultations across the basin, identified priority data sets and use cases. By 2011, however, ECCC had realized that providing an open access database within the restrictions of the Government of Canada structure at that time was not possible. Uh, oops, so. There we go. So shortly after it came to U of M, I was hired. 
And after working with it for a little while, I realized that the structure was not conducive to the multidisciplinary, ever-changing types of data we collected. So I began to explore other options. So I met with our libraries, I met with uh, multiple people that had experience using databases and data management. Uh, I looked at many sites online and I narrowed down my choices to three main databases based on the requirements you see in that slide. So I chose CCAM because it seemed to be the most flexible, easy to use, out of the box platform. And I began exploring the platform by setting up a server in my office. Uh, and then at the beginning of the pandemic, so we started off with a platform that was on a server in my office. It was moved into our IST, so that's our computing services at the university's infrastructure, uh, where it sat in its present, in its old form for many years as we tried it out. And then at the beginning of the pandemic, we were provided with the opportunity to completely redesign our current platform and including redeveloping the interface to align better with the new university website redesign, which was being created in Drupal. So the interface to the Canwin ecosystem was also rebuilt in Drupal, and both it and the CCAM platform were redesigned using the U of M visual identity guidelines. The project pages display the same images found on the project pages in our CIOS University created web page to provide users with a seamless transition. So this is the U of M Drupal page that exists on our CIOS website. And then this is that same project page, but within CCAM. So this is the main home page for our new Canwin platform. And once on that home page, users can choose to search for data spatially through a variety of ways. They can use the quick links option to go to pre-created dashboards or access our other platforms directly. So uh, we're using multiple servers to store our data. And users can also search for data sets directly by selecting data from the main menu bar. From that main menu uh, bar, users, our users can also view data stories, such as graphic novels, or map stories, which are this map stories hosted on our geospatial platform. And so these are other tools that we use to communicate science in plain language to reach a bigger audience. Now I'm going to take a step back from that broad overview and I'm going to highlight our infrastructure development. So this is just a high level application stack diagram. We have a mix of private and public platforms in order to get our data from a research project stage into a shareable stage. And all of those platforms are hosted on the U of M servers. Our infrastructure is managed as a distributed data ecosystem. And this may look familiar, Stephen, because I stole the layout <laughs> from you. The CCAM right. platform <laughs> acts as the federated metadata and data search engine, but users can access, view, and download data from multiple entry points depending on their requirements or preference. So we have three key platforms, which are the CCAM platform, GeoNode for geospatial data, and we have a SensorThink server. And we have public GitLab repos to allow us to contribute back to the open source community any improvements and new features that we've developed. We chose CCAN because it had the Postgres database structure to support structured data and allow viewing and some visualizations out of the box, as well as having the file store blob storage, which allows us to hold any type of information. We've enhanced this initial platform by building out this distributed ecosystem to allow us to support our spatial data, as well as support interoperability through use of additional platforms, such as the SensorThink server that I mentioned earlier. So the bot in the bottom diagram there, you're just looking at ways that we've taken uh, data from, in this case, meteorological stations we set up around some of our lakes. Uh, they get streamed in, transformed into the standard uh, OGC format through the sensor of things, and then they're served out to GeoServer, to GeoNode, which is the mapping platform, uh, as well as a digital dashboard display that uh, our partners wanted to see, which is a simple, clear uh, visual display. And then we also created a smart mirror in that instance. So Canwin is mindful of the CARE, FAIR, and OCAP principles for data sharing. So FAIR being the uh, 
findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible principles you see there. CARE being the overall principles regarding indigenous governance for data, and OCAT principles being the principles for First Nations, which were developed uh, in Canada. So we support the ethical sharing of open data in a way that considers both people and purpose in open data advocacy. And we support those principles through making the data ethically open, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And I'm not going to read those to you, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of those key features we use CCAN for. So CCAN supports that work through the key features such as uh, in the FAIR, by making it findable. We use the schema extensions to crosswalk uh, our core data, which we actually, when we recreated the metadata templates in CCAN, we map them to data site 4.4 metadata standards, and that allows us to crosswalk to other common schemas, such as uh, ESIP science on schema.org version of schema.org. Um, it makes it our data accessible by implementing the SSO extension to manage user res registration, um, as well as being hosted on U of M servers. It makes it interoperable by providing machine accessible endpoints using nationally agreed upon schemas. We use CCAN's RESTful type API, as well as having data accessible via programming languages such as Python and R, which is what's important for researchers as those are uh, languages that are common and better understood than something like SQL. Uh, the data is also made reproducible. CCAN's flexible structure allowed us to create fair digital objects for download, and we apply DOIs for provenance and metrics. CCAN's flexibility and use of extensions allows us to track our research in a manner that is meaningful to our researchers and for reporting. Our research is conducted at multiple scales, from the atmosphere to the ecosystem level, and within multiple disciplines. Most research is conducted as part of a major project or program, ranging from graduate level research, which costs tens of thousands of dollars, to major programs that may cost 30 million or more. We also manage multiple remote research stations and vessels, and of core equipment that is reused. To capture these complex relationships, we worked with Link Linked Digital to create seven different templates. So key data can be related multiple times, so we can reuse uh, a research vessel and for multiple projects. We use an agile GitLab workflow to support multiple levels of data deposition. We curate our core data and provide support for our researchers, but we also host data in whatever manner it is provided. We have six different categories we use to categorize those research outputs, which you can see on in the middle box there. So there's raw data, which has not been manipulated, data that has been curated to some degree called data, scripts, documents, which can include field logs, Supplemental information, which is anything that doesn't fit anywhere else, like images, and web services, such as links to our mapping platform or external services. Research outputs with DOIs also have an altmetrics badge embedded on the site, which you can see on the right there. Altmetrics are information about a research output that can be tracked and are an alternative to traditional metrics, which only measure the number of journal citations and are very domain-specific. So alt metrics include details such as the number of policy documents, tweets, or news articles that the research object was referenced by. These types of metrics allow us to get a better indication of how our work is translating into actionable information and allows us to provide funders and partners with a better picture of the impact of the research. By creating those seven different data templates and detailed metadata schemas, we are also able to provide data with additional contextual information and create a type of FAIR digital object to create to further support the FAIR and CARE principles. When a user downloads a FAIR digital object, and they do that by clicking the, so that's a FAIR digital object description, and they, in our site, they can create this FAIR digital object when they click the download package button on a page. And that will produce a zipped file that includes the metadata as a human readable PDF, five of the six research outputs, so it doesn't give them the raw data, and the metadata in machine readable format, which they can also access by clicking that export metadata button. So this is an example of a data set main search and results page. 
So every piece of information uh, we collect is called a research output, which I mentioned in our last slide. And that allows us to better track all the types of information associated with a project that we produce that is not specifically data, but just as necessary, particularly for reproducibility of research. So when you have a research, when you get a data set, you also need to know the methods used or the protocols used to create that data set, for example. Users can also conduct a smart search via the toolbar at the top with the results indicating what category the information is related to. So you can see it shows you if it's a facility, a keyword, or a project, etc. Once a user selects an item, they will be taken to that page. In this example, using a project page, there are multiple data sets with different metadata that have been associated with the project. A user can view them all from the main project page and then click on an individual link to view more details. Key statistics appear on the right-hand side there. The complete metadata records that will be embedded in the metadata file is shown at the bottom of the page. Um, and you can see that we've divided it into different tabs because there's a lot of metadata that we collect. Not all of it's required, but we do leave spaces for a lot. Now, I mentioned earlier that we integrate our other server data into the central CCAN platform. So, for example, we have an ERDAP server. An ERDAP uses the DAP protocol, which is an open source network protocol, and the DAP's native file format is NetCDF, which is commonly used for climate modeling or remote sensing data. In this example, the ERDAP data is discoverable in CCAN, even though it's hosted on ERDAP. This is how a data table appears in ERDAP, just to give you an example. So you can see it's not very user friendly and the filter options are more complicated to use than in CCAN. So from CCAN, the users are actually able to directly download the data in the native NetCDF format or take advantage of ERDAP's ability to convert the data to a CSV or other formats on the fly. And they can actually download the data as a CSV directly from, again, from the CCAN page without ever having to navigate that ERDAP interface. Integrating the ERDAP capabilities and making them accessible via the CCAN interface provides our users with a seamless experience and gives us another interoperable tool to share and harvest data from our other partners. So for example, this data set is actually not curated by us. It's hosted by another partner we have, which is the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System. And we're just bringing that data in uh, because it's data that's relevant to our uh, researchers. Data that has been curated to a certain level and loaded into our data store is also accessible via the CCAN API or the programming tools, as most of you know. So what's next? So we're currently in, I think, phase three. Uh, so now we're taking user feedback and we had some things we want to improve even uh, more so. So in this next phase, you can see that we wanted to allow users to download the ISO metadata that comes, that is created when you load a data file in ERDAP. So that also increases our interoperability piece. We have, we will be switching to using the data tables format because that allows us to, to it gives us more capabilities for filtering and downloading the data sets. Um, we've customized the data dictionary and we've revised the schema and we've done a bunch of other pretty little things. And finally, none of this would have been possible without the financial support of our funders. So I'd like to thank them. And I'd like to thank you all for listening. Uh, so I've got a quick question. Um, and I don't know the answer to this, but do any of your projects actually involve kind of citizen science as well? Or is it just uh, spec'd out academic researchers and such? Nope, it's citizen science as well. So we have a we put a lot of work into uh, collaborating with Indigenous communities, both in the Arctic and in freshwater. Um, and uh, the latest project that I just finished on the freshwater side, the weather stations that I talked about streaming in using the sensor server, sensor things server, was actually a community-based monitoring project. So now that one was with um, the Manitoba Métis Federation, and we trained so the other stations are actually on citizens' land. Métis, Métis uh, people are called citizens of the Métis Nation. So there's two individuals who have weather stations on their land. 
they were trained to take care of those weather stations, monitor them, and the Manitoba Métis Federation actually now maintains those weather stations with support from us in terms of curating the data. Um, and we do that for water quality as well as uh, other variables. Cool. Over to you, Augusto, if you had a question. Yeah, and then do. I have a quick question to clear. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation, first of all. Uh, it's a really nice showcase. Um, just out of interest, did you do a UX research job before implementing the portal? So how it was conducted kind of on the process side? Um, to, in terms of so that we made sure that we had a user interface that people wanted? Yeah, exactly. So basically, before software development, does anything happen? Yeah, so while this was sort of a backwards forwards process, because I had the CCAN, I had the, the base CCAN already implemented that we've been using for a few years, uh, because when I was hired, the expectation was we would have yeah. something serving the data. And then um, I did spend a number of years looking at other platforms, multiple platforms to see what worked for people and what didn't. And being a researcher myself, I also had that perspective. Um, a part of the look and feel of that platform, like in terms of uh, the color scheming and the fonts and all those kind of basic things are, de are designated by the U our university visual identity guidelines. So we were lucky in the sense that the university re redesigned the, or they actually put their web pages in Drupal, which constituted an entire redesign of the university look and feel. And so we were able to work with our uh, communications team at the university to make sure that our CCAN platform could align with that look. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. I think, Joe, you can go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Claire, this is a wonderful presentation. As it happens, I'm actually uh, working on a similar project uh, with the Texas Water Data Hub uh, in coordination with the Internet of Water Initiative out of Denver. And I was wondering if you guys are also implementing or coordinating uh, with that effort. And I would love to uh, offline sync up with you guys because you know, to Alex's point, the Texas team spent a year and a half doing user research, and we're changing up a lot of things on the, the CCAN workflow to make it friendlier for data publishers and decrease the friction of publishing data. So yeah, we'd like, we'd love to trade notes and see how we can leverage each other's work. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so we have two questions from the chat. Um, the first one is how long did it take to get the first or the base version online and how much women and men power did you have <laughs> i had me and the people at ist i could bother to troubleshoot uh, and i have a colleague who's quite skilled in computer programming so it actually out of the box it honestly did not take long it took a couple of days. It just out of the box, uh, you know, so to change the, the interface so that I had like our name and our image and we could upload data worked. Now, not all of, I couldn't implement extensions necessarily easily. So a few extensions would work like PDF view or um, data tables, but a lot of extensions wouldn't work without a lot of troubleshooting that I didn't have the time to do or couldn't do. So. We had a very basic platform implemented for, I'd say, a, a year, where we could at least say we could get your data in there and it would be accessible. While we worked a lot behind the scenes on, we had we were doing a lot of things at once, so we had to curate work. We had develop had to develop workflows to actually curate data, um, so that researchers could work at standardizing that information we wanted. We had to know what that looked like, and then I did hire a part time developer who was didn't know CCAN, but did know Linux, which is the platform we were using. 
uh, to work some of those extensions. So short answer, we did have it working within a couple of days. We had extensions that were customized and a mini customized schema with the developer were doing that. It took him a few months, um, but to get to this level, we needed to hire people who really knew what they were doing. All right, thank you. Now the next question is, did you leverage SICAM as it is or um, did you make any modifications? If what, what modifications were made? So can you clarify about what modifications would be, do you think? Out of the box, I'm guessing versus... Yeah, yeah so I think I can take that one. Yeah. So so obviously we tried to leverage the second core and uh, all the open source uh, extensions um, as much as possible. So as, as Claire mentioned, there are uh, seven uh, uh, metadata schemas that uh, we um, uh, had to implement and uh, relate to each other. So that's why we, we, we leveraged the uh, second skin extension uh, extensively uh, to, to make it happen. Uh, but most, so most of the uh, modifications were quite minor and were related to, to the integrations with other, uh, other systems like or DAP or the uh, uh, that widget uh, clear show that uh, allows you to to show the usage of the uh, data and things like that. We have sort of uh, custom modifications, but other than that, we try to to leverage as much as possible the open source uh, stuff. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, I guess, Abhishek or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So most of modifications were on the uh, around the schemas and or on the UI side. Okay. I'll take the silence as a no. As a yes, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so Oleg had a question. I don't know if you want to go ahead and just um, voice it or you want me to read it, because I, I, I'm pretty sure I saw you picking up your hand. Hello. Sorry, I've been having microphone issues, so I wasn't sure if I can... <laughs> this is going to work? Yeah, no? we can hear you, yeah. Ah, you can. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, my question, sorry about that. My question is just simply if there's, you, you know, the site as function at the bottom right of a data set, uh, I, I, I'm quite surprised to see that. Is that. I'm just wondering if that's a plugin, and I think if it's an effective um, function for you, uh, and if you have any other kind of technical wishes, um, such as Dublin Core uh, and, or Dublin Core archive support, that's something that you'd be looking for in CCAN, um, or if you have any other general thoughts about improving the way the data sets are attributed. Thanks. Yeah, so Dublin Core is of interest to us. So part of this, a lot of the work the CCADI has done is because one of the problems in data sharing is that um, getting data repositories to talk to each other can be challenging when they're all using different metadata standards. So we have a core standard we required, which was a very basic schema.org, which we actually modified to be the ESIP, which is the Earth Sciences version. Um, and then we, as a consortium, took that core and crosswalked it to individual data repositories, current metadata schemas, which includes Dublin Core, ISO, um, and data site. And with the idea that we actually built, there's another layer that exists with our partners, which is a semantic mediator, meaning that there'll be a central search site where our users can go search for data. It'll pull it in from any of the repositories, which are our partner. It'll pull it through the semantic mediator and actually convert the metadata to whatever standard we've crosswalked to if a user requires it. But that being said, Dublin Core is one of the, the basic standards, which it would be nice to be able to use out of the box, I think for a lot of people, because um, it is still very well used. The site as function, the feedback we get from users is that they really do like it because it makes it easy for them to know how to cite the information. And then the other thing that we use is those DOIs. 
so digital object identifiers that require a user. People are usually quite tuned into them if they're a research person so that they know they have to cite something if it has a DOI. That's super interesting, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, OK, so we have another question from Hamid. Can you give some more details about the difference between Seekin and GeoNode? If I'm not wrong, GeoNode is also used for sharing spatial data. Yes, you're right. So GeoNode is our, is our geospatial platform where we have uploaded core, what we would call core base layers, uh, which we think users would be interested in. So like a base map of um, different layers for Canada, a base map of some of our project areas, um, so which is useful for the public and for researchers and students. So a researcher can point their student to the site and say, look, if you're going to create a map, use these layers because they're standardized. We know where they came from. We know all the information about them. But that requires a different level of skill than someone who just wants to see a map. You know, so users, so if a project has a map layer available, we actually link it into CCAN so that if they never care about creating their own map, they can just click on that file and view the map in CCAN itself, which is one of the things our phase three will do is actually make that layer show as an actual layer in CCAN. But if they want to do more with that layer, or they want to download it for their own offline purposes, they can then download it from CCAN or go into GeoNode where they can do, they have more functionality so they can create their own maps or um, manipulate the map. Thank you. Another question from Augusto. I see that the resources of a data set are organized in different sections. Is that a second extension? If so, which one? So, so it, it, it is a, a feature that we implemented using the, the same second next uh, scheming. So essentially the, those uh, uh, sections are, are uh, part, they're defined uh, in, in uh, resources met that schema. Great. Um, and as I'm aware of time, I suggest we have one last question and then we can proceed to second three updates or any other updates from the community. Okay, I think we are uh, done. So thank you very much, Claire, for your interesting presentation. It was a pleasure to have you here at Second Monthly Live. And I, yeah, um, I think I'll pass over to Alex. Yeah, thanks, Yona. Do I have a chance to share the screen? Because um, it's disabled. I don't yes, I, I, can, I can make you be able to just one, give me one second. Mm -hmm. You should be able now. Well, oh, it works. Thank you. <laughs> when software works, it's always a small miracle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. So, uh, starting off, uh, what I have, um, you know, that we're doing the research, and this research is um, made to inform CCAN 30 strategy. So, basically, paving out the way uh, we are the platform where will go. And so the idea um, is not to get strategizing before we understand different perspectives. And this is why we want to hear every voice uh, that has anything to say. So we start with having conversations. And uh, thanks a lot to ones that uh, was in the meetings already. And we had a pretty nice uh, time uh, discussing CCAN. Uh, future and um, basically everything around again. Uh, do you have, do you see my uh, mural board? Yep. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so this is the uh, summary of what I have right now. Um, this is mostly kind of way to structure raw data that was gathered uh, during first, I believe it were two weeks of um, intensive uh, conversations. Each um, 
card here is the idea or something that we can do. And it's a kind of heat map when you go from uh, white to orange. So say, uh, if I heard uh, an idea once, it's white. If I hear it all the time, it's orange. And uh, there are quite a few you know, things like this. Uh, it was a bit unexpected for me that uh, some things are so kind of evident for everyone uh, that I've spoken to. And so uh, I propose to go through them first. Um, so first things to tell before I start is that uh, I'm so glad uh, being a part of this community. And it's, it's such a pleasure to talk to such an open-minded people, uh, which you find here. So it's uh, people who have passion around data, uh, who are doers. Uh, so <laughs> conversations were so kind of practical. It's such a, such a beautiful, uh, really low on theory, uh, hard in practice. Uh, I liked it very much. Um, okay, so start enough. Accessibility for non-data professionals. This is the first thing I hear almost every time. So um, working, kind of shifting work from preparing data to doing something useful with data. Um, I feel that it's pretty much a lot of job to do. But uh, Joel started this uh, this uh, topic, and he has his um, ideas around this. Uh, they're very interesting on how to basically make the platform um, a go-to place for people who don't want to do basic data cleansing or data preparation job and want to jump in straight to the storytelling. I don't trust it's something that can be done uh, quickly, but as a strategy, it could be a really interesting direction to take. Another one was around uh, search provider flexibility. So solar doesn't work for everybody here. I know it. Uh, so hope that it resonates with people in the meeting. And ability to use another provider could be really helpful. And it's all about it. So then we have um, decoupling front end and back end. Quite a technical job. Still a big deal for um, bypassing current interface. And there are companies that don't use current interface at all, or clients, or uh, don't use it at all. And so providing better flexibility around attaching own front end, um, possibly React, Next.js, any type of modern technology to the backend that C can provide could be another technical um, solution uh, to develop further. Uh, installing updates easier, so you don't have to go through each uh, container and update it if you let it a uh, second instance. Accessibility for user is quite a topic, quite a bigger topic, but many conversations roll around it because um, what I found out is that uh, people I talk to, they occupy several roles. So a person could be researcher, uh, developer who is contributing to the code base and uh, maintainer for a platform with users. So. Uh, he could know uh, basically different perspectives. And getting the platform more accessible to newcomers or to users, basically to anyone uh, who enters it and want to do the job uh, is another big, say, opportunity for improvement. Ability to do that for different data storage, you can see it, it, it comes uh, w within the developer um, uh, developer structure, so uh, Dockerize setup that is made easier. So what else? Some um, user management um, and supporting materials. This is the stuff that I heard more than once. Although what I'm trying to do is to capture everything I hear, 
So I particularly like the community platform idea. So um, and it should be an ability to get a, bring a feedback to data set. So if researcher used it and he can rank it or provide some type of comments and spark a discussion there, that should be interesting. So uh, we are an international community and working across countries, across industries, helping each other with something we learned and contributing in this way uh, could be a, a really interesting contribution on the level outside of the software development. So um, final words for me uh, is that um, there are quite a number of roles. It's not exhaustive. Uh, it's definitely um, kind of bigger, uh, say, uh, boxes uh, where we can put um, feedback. Um, I really miss feedback from the end users. So I got one. I got one, and uh, uh, the person wasn't happy about how the content was structured on the page where he grabs data. Now, that's why I loved these um, download data sets and export files uh, from the presentation. Thanks, Carolyn. That's uh, quite uh, insightful. I, I would love to have this conversation on you on how you get to this, how it works, how it works for um, visitors of your portal, because this is what he was unsure about. So, kind of, there could be two solutions. Uh, to the problem that he highlighted, a uh, design solution and a training solution. So it most so it more revolved around how people upload the data for um, uh, for the use uh, of, of the users afterwards. And this is another thing uh, that design can solve by providing a clear kind of way on how to do it, limiting the amount of options, but uh, kind of streamlining the flow into the right direction for a person who, who uh, fills the form. And so it could be a lot of things like this. I really want to know everything before we make decision where we go. F from development standpoint, it's pretty clear what to do, but I would rather be heavier on users on understanding their needs Although anyone on this call who would like to add his ideas or thoughts, uh, and I see that some people already uh, scheduled the call. So I really uh, invite you to the office hours that we have with Stephen each Tuesday. So in Europe, it's morning. Uh, in Australia, it's evening. Um, uh, or uh, schedule a call with me. Um, you want to provide a link within a blog post or just find me over LinkedIn. We can negotiate a time that convenient for you. And so uh, this is basically what I have right now. And I'm really looking forward for getting more and more feedback, more and more interesting insights from you. Thanks a lot. Hope I didn't take too much time. Um. No, that's fine. Um, if somebody wants some, um, want to make a comment or something, please um, feel free to do it pretty quickly. I'd like to stress upon the fact that we have a new LinkedIn page and it is now gaining power. So please follow us there. Um, we have a LinkedIn group and also now we have a um, LinkedIn new company page, brand new. So yeah, don't forget to follow us. Things in the chat that I've missed and if not, we can say goodbye. So there is a conversation going on between Yaroslav and Oleg. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I'm not going to voice it. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. So thank you, everyone.